In the fall of 1924, Curtis Welsh, the only doctor in the port town of Nome in Alaska, raised the alarm. There was too little of the cure for diphtheria, a highly dangerous and easy-to-spread disease that was quite common for the time. Dr. Welsh ordered an additional batch and was hoping to receive it before winter because otherwise the town would be locked out by ice for eight months. But the ship with the cure didn't make it in time, and the town had no choice but to wait until spring. There were no signs of an outbreak in Nome, but Dr. Welsh was still beside himself for some reason. In December, he took in several children with a sore throat, and although he ruled out diphtheria, his suspicions grew with every passing day. Until finally, in January 1925, they turned out to be correct. He officially diagnosed the first case of the disease. Nome was home to about 2,000 people, but 10,000 more lived in the surrounding area, all at risk of contracting the illness. Dr. Welsh made sure the situation reached the ears of everyone in power to help, and an emergency committee was formed while the town was put on quarantine. Over a million units of the cure, enough to stop the spread, were found across the country and shipped to Alaska. But the real challenge was to get them to Nome itself. The port was still frozen solid. The railroad ended in Inanna, 674 miles away, and airplanes of the time were incapable of flying in the extreme temperatures of the subarctic. Thus, after a brief discussion, the only solution was agreed upon – dog sleds. Sled dogs and their drivers, called mushers, were the pride of Alaska and also the main carriers of the mail since there wasn't any transport able to navigate the area. For the salvation race of 1925, only the top mushers were chosen. Dr. Wells calculated that the serum could survive no more than six days in the harsh conditions on the trail, after which it needed to thaw, so the dogs had to be as fast as possible. The best among the mushers was Leonard Sapala with his lead dog, a Siberian husky named Togo. They were based in Nome and became a local legend for being the fastest and hardiest team ever. The cure was to be delivered by train to Ninana and taken from there by dogs in a two-team relay. One team, loaded with a precious cargo, would start in Ninana, while the other would run to meet them from Nome. The meeting point was almost halfway, in the town of Nulato. Sapala was chosen to make over 400 miles from Nome and back, but after he set off, it was decided to add more teams into the relay to make it faster, breaking the race into 30-mile legs, give or take. He didn't know about that, which almost ended in a catastrophe for Nome. Sopala and his sled ran as fast as they could, cutting the distance across Norton Sound, an inlet of the Bering Sea, which was hazardous because of the shifting ice. He was the only musher who dared this shortcut, and it saved a full day of travel. The team successfully crossed the treacherous area, although the weather was terrifying. As if to conspire against the humans, the winter of 1925 was the coldest in 20 years, with gales dropping the temperature as low as minus 100 degrees at times. When they were 170 miles into the race, Sopala, sure he still had almost 50 miles ahead of him, suddenly saw another musher having trouble with his dogs. He raced past, not wanting to slow down, when he heard the man calling out to him through the wind and snow. The serum! The serum! I have it here! It turned out that the mushers going from the other side were indeed faster. The man got the cure more than a full day ahead of the original schedule, and it was a pure chance that he saw Sopala like he did. If they hadn't met, the medicine could have easily been lost, sealing Nome's fate. Sopala took the cargo from the other man and turned around. Night was falling. He had to make his way back in what would be the most perilous part of the journey. He gave his dogs and himself a short rest and made up his mind. He would dare the crossing of Norton Sound again. The winds grew even stronger, and a full-blown blizzard started when Sopala was halfway through the sound. He was afraid they'd lose their way and get stranded on an ice drift. But Togo, his trusty lead dog, had a perfect sense of smell and led the team as surely as ever. And then Sopala heard an ominous creak. The worst had happened. The ice was moving underneath them. If the ice flow started, the whole team could be stranded in the open sea. He didn't know how much they had to go in the snowstorm, 
with almost zero visibility. But he trusted his dogs, and especially Togo, and so they pressed on. The creaking got worse, and Sapala was so intent on getting out of it alive that he was almost taken by surprise when the snow veil suddenly lifted and he saw the shore. They made it. Still, it was a long way before the end of the race. They reached a roadhouse on the other side of Norton Sound and took some rest, only to continue going four short hours later. Togo, persevering as ever, led his team onward and up toward Mount Little McKinley, a climb of eight miles in total. Finally, the sled arrived at the town of Gullivan, where they were met by the next musher on the trail and transferred the cargo. All in all, the team covered over 260 miles in five days, beating every other sled by a wide margin. Justice demanded that Togo have all the glory for his historic efforts, but the reality was different. The last leg of a little over 50 miles was covered by Gunnar Kassen and his lead dog, Balto. Kassen was to only travel half that distance, in fact, but he arrived to the relay point too early and found that his change was asleep. Not to lose time, he decided to press on and deliver the medicine himself. Balto seemingly approved. He was still full of strength even after enduring a long trip in the blizzard and chilling cold. So it happened that on February 2nd, at 5.30 a.m., the cure arrived to Nome and was ready to use within several hours. The citizens were overjoyed and greeted Kassen and Balto with cheers. Soon after, their fame outgrew the town and even Alaska making the team celebrities across the whole country. Even though every member of the relay received awards and commendations from the president, Balto's fame went much further. He received a symbolic bone-shaped key to the city of Los Angeles, a statue in New York, and even starred in a movie. And 70 years later, a cartoon based on the events was made by Disney. Togo received his share of glory too but his role in what became known as the Great Surum Run wasn't as widely acknowledged. Sapala and his lead dog traveled across many of the states the following year, gathering cheering crowds everywhere. Finally, they decided to stay in a town of Poland Spring, Maine, where Sapala opened a kennel of Siberian huskies. There, Togo lived in love and respect until the end of his life in 1929. Three years later, Leonard Sapala sold his kennels and returned to Alaska to participate in the Winter Olympics as a sled dog driver. His team won silver. Of the events of the Great Surum Run, he only said one thing. He was glad that everything happened as it did, but the only thing that upset him was that Togo wasn't recognized as the true hero of that race. Surely he would have been happy to know that with time, The brave dog finally received the acclaim he deserved like no other. And that's how it was. It's winter, 1980. We're in the small town of Lengbe. 19-year-old Jean Hilliard is driving home after meeting with a friend. She takes a shortcut and turns into an icy, slippery road. In the dark, she loses control of the rear-wheel drive car. The vehicle crashes into a ditch. Emergency lights, snowfall, night, and a hard frost. Jean gets out of the vehicle. She's wearing only a light winter coat, mittens, and cowboy boots. The air temperature is much lower than in a freezer. Jean is sure that her friend lives nearby, so she goes that way. She climbs a high hill and realizes she's taken the wrong route. It seems she's gotten lost. The girl wanders a couple more miles and notices her other friend's house in the distance. Freezing, she walks there. Then everything turns black. Jean loses consciousness. The next morning, rancher Wally Nelson wakes up in a great mood. It's the holiday season. There's a winter fairy tale outside the window. He leaves his house and notices the body of Jean Hilliard lying just a few feet from his porch. 
While he approaches the girl, shakes her, and is horrified. Her body is stiff and cold like frozen wood. Her eyes are open and don't move. Her hair is frozen. She just doesn't look alive. But Wally sees that she's still breathing. Jean has managed to survive. Wally wants to put her in his car to bring her to the doctor. But the girl's body doesn't bend and can't fit into the auto. It feels like a statue. He takes a bigger car and rushes to the hospital as fast as possible. The doctors take Jean, but they don't think she has any chance to make it. Her hand is so hard and frozen that no needle can penetrate it. A low temperature, glassy eyes, and muscles as hard as stone are all the results of emergency mode. Her body has directed all the blood to the vital organs to ensure their functioning. That's why other parts of her body look so lifeless, and her skin and muscles don't react to anything. The doctors decide to put heating pads on the girl to warm her up. Her family hopes for her recovery, but right now, all they can do is just wait. Frostbite is so dangerous because all that frozen liquid begins to expand. Fill a small bottle with water and put it in the freezer for a few hours. Then take it out and you'll see that the bottle seems to have expanded or even cracked because of the increased volume of the liquid. The same thing happens inside our bodies. We consist of almost 70% water. When it freezes, its particles turn into ice crystals and tear cell membranes. Ice fragments can stretch and destroy tissue. This is called frostbite. Also, our body can slow down all internal processes in extreme cold conditions to save strength and energy. The heart makes fewer beats, and the lungs stop consuming lots of oxygen. Metabolism slows down. It happened with Jean, and perhaps it is what saved her life that day. She was lying in the snow in severe frost for about 6 hours. But why didn't the ice particles start destroying her cell membranes? How did her body withstand such damage and manage to survive? Back at the hospital, doctors are happy to watch Jean get better. Warm blood spreads through the frozen vessels and brings her body back to life. Surprisingly, ice crystals haven't damaged her muscles and skin. A few hours later, the girl regains consciousness. By noon, she starts talking. Jean doesn't know what happened. She remembers walking to her friend's house and then waking up in the hospital. What worries her most right now is that her father's car is somewhere in a ditch. As it turns out, the girl fell down and crawled on all fours to Wally Nelson's house. She doesn't remember it, but apparently, her brain activated the survival instinct that night. Unfortunately, she didn't manage to crawl the last few feet. Jean passed out at the door and stayed there for six hours. Doctors examine the girl and understand that she's completely healthy. Soon, she's discharged from the hospital. This case isn't unique. One professor of emergency medicine, David Plummer, said he'd seen about 12 similar cases over the past 10 years when patients had survived severe frostbite. Jean returns home and finds out that she has become famous. People write about her in newspapers, want to interview her, and film documentary shows. Her case has attracted the attention of many doctors around the world. But no one has been able to find out exactly how she managed to survive. In the case of humans, such recoveries seem like an absolute miracle. But many creatures of the natural world can adapt their bodies to extreme conditions. One of them is the tree frog. These animals live mainly in temperate and tropical parts of Eurasia. Sometimes they have to contend with cold weather. Their body injects glucose into the bloodstream when they feel they're freezing. And the content of their cells turns into syrup. Sugar lowers the freezing point of water. So, tree frogs have adapted to such conditions. The water outside their cells can freeze. Their bodies can get as hard as ice cubes. But they will be alive, feeling great. Then, when it gets warmer, they fully recover. The blood fills their body and puts all their muscles in motion. But one of the most amazing animals that can withstand freezing temperatures is the ghoulish ice fish. 
It's transparent and somewhat like a jellyfish. It swims in the dark, cold Antarctic waters. The ghoulish ice fish feels comfortable there because of the antifreeze in its body. More precisely, it's a unique substance that is like antifreeze in its functions. This liquid doesn't allow the animal's cells, organs, and the whole body to freeze. There are no red blood cells in the fish's blood that transport oxygen throughout its body. This is the only vertebrate with such a superpower. There are organisms on our planet that use the coal to prolong their life. Scientists have found some of them in the ice of Siberia. Those are microscopic, multi-celled creatures, like small worms, that can live in a freezer for about 10 years. But the worms from Siberia were about 24,000 years old. The scientists transported them to the laboratory and thawed them. The worms came to life and began to multiply immediately after all those centuries of sleep. Their bodies can go into cryptobiosis. This is when an entire frozen organism has minimal vital functions. The analysis showed that the worms could stay in this mode for tens of thousands of years. And there are many such animals on our planet. Also, these creatures are some of the world's most resistant to radiation. They are practically invulnerable. Now back to our story. It's possible that Gene Hilliard's body went into short cryptobiosis. Perhaps there was some non-freezing liquid in the girl's blood, but no one knows for sure. These days, she has an ordinary job and almost doesn't remember that day. Further research on this topic can help scientists create special medicines that can help in freezing temperatures. Just imagine that you could safely go outside in the winter wearing a t-shirt and a pair of shorts. Steam would be coming off your body and the ice under your feet would be melting. You'd feel hot inside. A dream, perhaps. But realistically, winter coat manufacturers would, of course, never allow it. 